wasn't a simple murder, bang, you're dead. Police received a 911 call that summoned them to a normal middle-class neighborhood. And that's when we found his body. They weren't quite sure what they had on their hand. But there was nothing normal about what they discover. I feel like they need a little song created for the Sippendales to the tune of Rescue Rangers. I know the intention was to play off the strippers, but the Rescue Rangers already have a song we can work with, you know? Ugh. Intros are and will forever be the hardest thing for me, clearly. Hello, my beautiful friends. Welcome to True Crime Wine Wednesday. If you're new here, hi, hello, welcome. I am Sherilyn and I am so glad you found me. If you're not new here, welcome back. Thank you for joining me every single Wednesday. I feel like I can actually say that because lately your girl has been on it with the Wednesday. That is because I have amazing people behind me helping. Thank you. I cannot take all the credit for the consistent content that is being delivered on time for you. It's allowed me to explore different forms of content for you and I can't thank you enough again for the support on the new viewer submissions. It's really not uncommon for something new on a channel to take a lot of time to, I guess, gain support and that's fully understandable. You know, you subscribe to a channel for usually one specific reason. So when things are added or they kind of go out a little bit from what you're comfortable and you're used to, it takes some time getting used to and some might not even get there at all. But to only be in three episodes and have the support and love that I do with it right now, it's just, I can't thank you enough. I said it in the last viewer submission video, but I wanna say it on here too. It just makes me feel proud to be using my channel and my platform to help people be heard when their story might not be you know, enough to have a full hour video on it, but sharing it helps so many people and it also helps the sharer in this therapeutic way by getting it out there and realizing that they're not alone when they see other people resonate with the story. And they also feel like they're helping because they're sharing it. So thank you, thank you, thank you. They will continue. But Wine Wednesday will also continue, so don't worry about that. But if you are somebody who's not into the whole sharing story content, I have made two different playlists now on the channel. So I have all of my True Crime Wine Wednesday content just in one playlist for you. So it's super easy if that's all you want to watch. And then I have another playlist going now that we're slowly adding to with me reading the viewer's submissions as well. So if that's something that you want to also just incorporate here and there within the True Crime Ryan Wednesday, it's really easy to find it that way. I've had a few people ask if the podcast is returning. It is returning. When that happens, I have a whole other channel created for that. I feel like when it comes to podcasts, that is definitely an a, a whole world of its own and it's definitely not for everybody and specifically because although the title of it is Murder Between Friends, really it's to get to know the creators, survivors I'm gonna start having on, advocates. And so that's not always a, it's not a true crime story. It's more of a chat. So that's gonna have its own channel completely separate. And I feel like that'll keep things a little bit more organized for everybody. All right, thank you for bearing with me through all of those messages. Before we get started, I have one more for you. I wanna give a huge thank you to our sponsor today, Fuzzy. If you're not familiar with Fuzzy, it's a telehealth service for pet parents that offers 24 seven personalized pet care from veterinary professionals. They are available 24 seven, seven days a week in a live chat. They're there for you for everyday questions to middle of the night emergencies. There really is no question too big or too small for them. Someone in the comments the last time Fuzzy sponsored said that this was the perfect app for them because they were a pet parent hypochondriac and that is so relatable. I'm a hypochondriac just on my own, then with my kids, then with my pets. So it is a really nice comfort to just have somebody instantly there before your mind wanders and goes crazy and you get on Google. The other day that was happening with me while I was just looking at our cat Khaleesi. Ever since our boy Tank passed away, she's uh, been a little bit of a, a, a a mess. It was really unexpected because they didn't seem to get along when he was here. They were a cat and dog and fought like cats and dogs. But after he passed, she just obsessively started ripping the hair out of her stomach. So the other day I was looking at her and I thought, okay, this is not getting better. I thought maybe it was just a habit, a little bit of stress. And she'd work 
it all, you know, out as time went on. It hasn't been the case. So I hopped on the app so that I could seek professional advice and not Google. She told me that it's called fur mowing. It can happen for a number of reasons. Some of them are very severe. Some of them are not as serious. We eliminated quite a few options and we came to the conclusion of trying first some behavioral redirection. It sounds like it is a little bit of stress and anxiety from the house changing as well as the whole mes Mexico fiasco because poor little thing was along for that as well. So she gave me some suggestions and after I felt so much better and I loved that it was a real person. We had a real conversation. We were cracking jokes. She was making me laugh. She asked for pictures of Khaleesi and her tummy and told me she was so cute and just had emotion and a heart and was a real person, which I really appreciated. The icing on the cake was that all of the time she spent with me would have probably been a little bit of a gouge to the wallet had we gone to the vet. I just got off the conversation feeling so positive. So all around, I cannot say enough about this app. Right now, Fuzzy is offering my Sippendales a free seven day trial membership. Go to yourfuzzy.com slash Sherilyn today to sign up. That provides you with a free seven day trial and you get access to exclusive member discounts on pet meds, supplements, food, and more. Go to yourfuzzy.com slash Sherilyn. Again, yourfuzzy.com slash Sherilyn for your free access to Fuzzy, access to 24 seven personalized pet care and vet recommended products. Thank you Fuzzy for sponsoring today's video and thank you so much to Stacy for your help with Khaleesi. All right, riddle time. Sam is talking to his lawyer in jail. They are very upset because the judge has refused to grant bail. At the end of the conversation, Sam is allowed to leave the jail. Why? All right, grab your drinks, grab your snacks. If you are like my longtime supporter and beautiful friend Arwen, you are cracking a Dr. Pepper right now. And let's get started. Last week I read the book, She is Evil by Judith Yates and it stuck with me. It was really powerful and enlightening in terms of bringing domestic violence to light and how easy it is to become a victim and even sometimes a perpetrator. Just since starting the new series where I'm reading viewer submissions every single day, I cannot put a number to how many emails I get about domestic violence. Thankfully, many of the stories that are submitted in terms of domestic violence submissions are from survivors who were able to escape with their life, but it's so important to share those because you could easily become a victim in a story like this. Another thing that's really important to bring up is that it's not always a woman that's a victim. And we need to listen to and look out for the men in our lives who may become an unknowing victim themselves, which is what happened to single father and adored friend Ijaz Ahmed in Memphis, Tennessee in April, 2003. Ijaz Ahmed was born on February 8th, 1962 in Faisalabad, Pakistan. I apologize, I'm sure I'm mispronouncing that. His parents were from India, but they had moved to Pakistan after the second world war. His father started their life from the ground up. He owned several businesses and lived and breathed to work hard for his family. Ijaz was the baby of the family and his father passed away when he was quite young. So it was his mom that he saw take on all of the responsibilities of raising kids and working hard to provide for their family. She had the same drive and work ethic as her husband. So it showed her kids what was possible with that mindset and determination. Tragically, she also passed when Ijaz was only 18 years old and oh, it was such a heartbreaking story. Her last words to her son were, promise me you will go to America and get a good education. She had literally woken him up from his sleep one day, told him that she had been saving money, put it aside for him to get a education and she wanted him to do it in America. He was kind of confused, half asleep, but said, okay, mom, I will. And right then and there, she slumped in his arms and passed away. She died of a heart attack. He fulfilled the promise. He went to the USA. He learned English, French, Arabic on top of his mother tongue, Urdu? I, I, I'm so sorry, you guys. Initially, when he arrived, he moved to Alabama and then got a roommate in Memphis. His roommate said they had a lot of fun together. Getting along with Ijaz was very effortless. He was over six feet tall and had these 
eyes that were very warm and inviting and the smile that was just captivating. One of Ijaz's favorite things to do was to cook for his friends and he often cooked his favorite dishes from back home. He was definitely open to trying American dishes too. One of the things that he loved when he first arrived was peanut butter. I guess he was just blown away by peanut butter and put it on absolutely anything and everything, fully relatable. Sadly for him though, that was a little bit too much and the obsession just came on too strong too fast and he couldn't even look at it anymore. On top of being so kind and, and friendly, Ijaz was also very intelligent. He transferred to Memphis State College from University of Mississippi and got two masters in engineering. After graduating, he started several businesses and he had this knack for entrepreneurship. He owned two gas stations, he had a fish market, he had a shop called Regal Imports that was located in the Memphis Mall where he would sell items from back home. He also sold cars and had rental properties and it was clear that he wasn't afraid of hard work and he definitely learned that from his mother who took over all of those responsibilities when his father passed. Through his hard work, he did quite well financially. And with that, he loved to help other people as much as he could. His friends who became his family when he moved to Tennessee said that Ijaz was one of the kindest people they had ever met. He was literally the epitome of give the shirt off of his back if somebody needed it without question. He was also described as a natural flirt, but very respectful. He wouldn't form a relationship with somebody unless there was the intention of it going somewhere serious and ultimately to marriage. He was a proud Muslim man, so he followed those teachings in that way of life. In January 1988, he met who he saw his future with. Her name was Bonnie, and she met Ijaz one afternoon while she was at her mother's house and a mutual friend of her mom's brought Ijaz for a visit. She says instantly when she saw him, she knew she wanted to marry him. She was a single mom because her first husband had left her and her son when he didn't want to do that gig anymore. She wasn't closed off from love though. She was hopeful that she was gonna find a partner who wanted to be just as involved in being a husband and a parent as she was. Bonnie loved to sing and one of her mother's favorite things to listen to was her singing. So that afternoon she asked Bonnie to sing a song and as soon as she opened her mouth, Ijez just, he fell in love with her voice. On their first date, they went to a movie and then spent the evening talking. She got absolutely swept away from his accent and his smile and how smart he was. He also made her laugh a lot. He kept trying to get her to tell him that he looked identical to Al Pacino in Scarface. He was a big Al Pacino guy. And the whole Scarface comparison is pretty funny because he would have been the purest Scarface. He didn't believe in smoking or drinking and Bonnie also didn't live that lifestyle. So they were very well suited for each other. It's it sounds like she was a smitten kitten. He loved to spoil her. He would buy her traditional dresses and jewelry from back home. But the most important thing about Ijaz to her was his desire to be a father. He naturally took care of her son like his own. He liked to bring him to the mosque and tell him stories about his life back home and most definitely showed him the value in working hard. So in November of 1988, they decided one day they were gonna elope. Before they did though, they went to Bonnie's mom's because he, Ijaz knew and respected how close they were and he was also very close to Bonnie's mother as well. So they rolled up, she was in gardening clothes. They said, you gotta get out of those, change into something. And then they took her to the, the courthouse, Hort House. Hello, 911? Why am I like this? I read a few weeks after this elopement, they did get remarried at the mosque because Ijaz just didn't feel right about not having that part of his life included. And his mother-in-law said it was just one of the most beautiful experiences she had. Everybody there was just so warm and kind and loving and inviting. Although everything lined up to look like it was going to be this long, fairy tale, idyllic love. His wife realized after marrying him that she was still holding on to a lot of insecurities that she had from her past relationship. She felt like any minute Ijaz was gonna change and leave her. She was just kind of on edge and had this guard up waiting for it to happen. She ended up quickly getting cold feet because of it and without discussing anything with Ijaz or her family and friends, she quickly filed for divorce. Ijaz was heartbroken. He felt very caught off guard. They both were very hurt. She was still very much in love with Ijaz. She was just trying to protect her, her heart and 
I almost said fart. Like, why am I like this? And that's fair, but they were able to speak about their feelings. She laid everything out there. And after some time and building up that trust that she saw in Ejaz, they remarried. The new newlyweds lived with Bonnie's mother because Ejaz knew how important that relationship was to Bonnie. And also he felt it was their responsibility to make sure that she was cared for. They became very, very tight great friends. She definitely looked at him like a son. Ijaz loved to show her how to cook up his favorite meals. They'd cooked a lot in the kitchen together and he also liked watching his favorite movies from back home with her. As great as Ijaz was as a son-in-law, he was an even better father to the son that he eventually had with Bonnie in August of 1991. His name was Jordan but Ijaz called him Tarek which is what his Muslim name was and to say he was proud of his son it sounds it's like that word is an understatement. He adored him. Jordan was just as kind and loving as his father and he also shared the same strong values in working hard and also religious beliefs. On Fridays he would go to the mosque with Ijaz and then Ijaz encouraged him on Sundays to go to the church with his mother and grandmother. And I really feel like that, you know, is doing it right. Being open to both parents' beliefs and just allowing Jordan to be who he wanted to and make the decisions that were going to lead him to be the best he could be in life. Ijaz wasn't opposed to also picking up, you know, Western traditions or way of life either. He loved mowing the lawn, which they don't have grass from where he was. So you could always see him in the front just mowing the yard. And he also turned into a kid when it was Halloween time. He loved scaring everybody that was coming around, trick or treating, and he would just laugh as soon as he saw their expressions. Also was a huge fan of the 4th of July, with all the fireworks. Now, although this openness to include Jordan in both of their faiths was very healthy for Jordan to make that decision, it, it did put a strain a little bit on the marriage. Bonnie and Ejaz were just such strong believers in each of their faiths and Ijaz wanted somebody who would come to the mosque with him and convert to the Muslim faith. And Bonnie wasn't opposed to wearing a hijab sometimes. It was never forced upon her or anything. She did like to go to the mosque as well, but she thought that if she were to convert to something, it just wouldn't be honest because her heart was in a different religion. So after seven years of marriage, they knew it was time to divorce. They didn't want to try to change each other. And they realized that as time went on, those things that they thought they could navigate early on in the relationship, they just couldn't anymore. I don't think Ijaz was fully prepared. I think that he would have probably waited it out a little bit longer and, and tried to figure it out. It took him a lot for his heart to mend. And the good thing was they still were actively involved in each other's lives. They were wonderful co-parents together. And he also thankfully didn't lose that relationship with his mother-in-law. Now, a big part of Ijaz's faith was to help members of the community. If someone was in need of a warm meal, a vehicle, a place to stay for free, Ijaz was the person they would go to. This is a man with a heart so big that when his crush, Princess Diana, passed away, he went into fetal position and just bawled like a baby. So when a good friend of Ijaz's introduces him to a woman who needs a break in life, an opportunity to get back on her feet, Ijaz was more than willing to help. Her name was Leah Joy Ward, born Leah Joy Rogers, on December 19th, 1966 in Ripley, Mississippi. She was the middle child to her father who had been in the military and was working at a local factory and her mom who was a teacher. When the kids were still young, the family moved to Adamsville to give their children a life full of adventure and play. They moved on this beautiful property that was surrounded by woods so the kids could just kind of go and let loose and make memories. Leah's interpretation of her childhood is that she and her siblings were raised very strict. Their parents were Pentecostal, so religion was used as fear. When she started school in elementary, Leah loved it. She was an eager learner and got along with her teachers and classmates. But in the fifth grade, she shifted. She started talking back to teachers, got in trouble for socializing, wasn't doing her homework. And in her teens, she just full on rebelled. She was smoking pot every day, drinking, getting in fights 
at school. Her parents didn't really know how to deal with the situation. They tried to reel her back and get her back under their control by admitting her to mental hospitals. And they thought it was working when she would come home. It seemed like she kind of was back on track. But then as time went on, she would just fall back into the same patterns. She first got in trouble with the police when she was only 14 years old because she stole her grandmother's car and then crashed it into another vehicle while she was trying to run away from home. She did this again, actually, with her brother's truck another time and crash it into a trailer. Each time she would get into trouble, her parents would take her back to the hospital and eventually she was diagnosed with adjustment disorder. Some of her symptoms were making reckless decisions, anxiety, depression, and sometimes even suicidal thoughts. There was one time after she was discharged from the hospital that she spent six months in a ministry group home type situation and when she was released from there, she seemed to be doing much better. Her family felt like they were seeing more of the old Leah that they loved. She had this side of her that was very kind and she liked to make people laugh. But then there was that shift again where whatever that sweet and kind side of her was, she could go in an instant to whatever was completely opposite of that. When she was 17 years old, she tried to stab a guy at her school. Luckily, he wasn't hurt because the knife was taken away from her before she could do any damage. But the inability to control her emotions was starting to become dangerous. That same year she got pregnant and instead of being really upset, her parents were actually hopeful that this was gonna show her some responsibility and maybe change her focus into taking care of something and showing more of that loving side. Being as religious as they were, they insisted that when she got pregnant, she marry her boyfriend who was a guy named Larry Ward. There didn't seem to be much love on either part. His accounts of the marriage were that she was very difficult to be with. He said it was very hard to please her, but he wanted to do the right thing since he had gotten her pregnant so he just tried to tough it out. After the birth of their first child who was a little boy, a little girl followed shortly after. Unfortunately, the family situation didn't do much in terms of pulling Leah back. Her husband suspected that she started using cocaine and meth and her behavior had started to become really erratic towards him. He said one evening she just burst into the bathroom while he was showering and she's standing there with two knives threatening to kill him. Leah's account of the relationship is that he was abusive. There was a domestic violence charge that Leah had against her husband. His version of the events was there was one morning that he and his cousin were heading out to work on the tugboats. When he did this, he would be gone for weeks at a time. So Larry was saying goodbye to the kids and his son in particularly was really upset. Larry said as he was getting into the car, he looked back and he could see that his son was crying at the screen door and Leah opened the door and in his mind, he thought, okay, she's opening it so that he can run out and come say goodbye to me. That's not what happened, trigger warning for reference of child abuse. Instead, he sees her lift up her foot and just kick him in the back and he falls to the ground. His cousin reacts quickly, runs to his son and as he's running, he says, if you don't, you know, her, I will. Larry starts running for Leah. She runs through the house, out the back door, and he just stops and says, it's absolutely not worth it. Goes back to tend his son to make sure that he's okay. Minutes later, the police show up and they arrest him for domestic violence. They said when she ran out the back door, she ran and called 911 and said that he was abusing her. He stayed after this incident. He still wanted to be there for the kids and he was hopeful that this type of behavior was just a reflection on the addiction that Leah was in and he thought as soon as she gets help, things will get better. There was a period of time in her life that it was looking like that was the direction they were headed. She got a job as an assistant for a nurse in a nursing home and she also got a job at a lawn mowing company, both of which she seemed to enjoy. But Larry worked on the tugboats for his profession and this made him not be home every night. Often times he was gone for weeks at a time, which is a strain on a healthy relationship, let alone one that's kind of got its ups and downs. So two years into the marriage, she filed for divorce. Her reasoning was a fight between them that was so bad that she ended up in the hospital. His account of the final straw of the relationship is when he came home from working on the tugboats, he came home to a house of strangers partying in his house and his vehicle smelt like 
crack cocaine. He told her and everybody else to leave the house and she went and filed a restraining order against him and then phoned him the next evening to talk. When they hung up, she called the police to say that he violated the restraining order by speaking to her. They came to arrest him, but it wasn't until he was able to say, she called me, they dropped the order believing that she was trying to set him up. After her divorce, she continued to hang out around the wrong crowd. She moved in with a drug dealer and was heavily using meth and cocaine. And she also started working the streets to support her habit. In November, 2000, she was arrested and charged with aiding in selling drugs and sentenced to 27 months in prison. Less than a year later in October, 2001, she was released on parole and sent to a halfway house in Memphis. After her release, things seemed to be looking up. She got a job at Kmart and Larry was even at the point where he was bringing the kids around more, but by 2002, she was back living on the streets. This is when she met a, a man who befriended her and he had this soft spot for Leah. He wanted to get her help, but he wasn't in the position to do it, but he was friends with Ejaz. So he brought Leah with him one day to meet Ejaz, knowing that he was always the guy that you turn to when you needed help. He outright asks if Leah's able to stay with Ejaz just until she gets on her feet. And he says, unfortunately, no, I can't live with a woman unless I'm married to her. He did want to help her though. And since he had rental properties, he says he did have a unit that was free. It wasn't in a good area at all, but it was a place that she could stay without paying if she wanted to. She takes them up on the offer, but while she's there, Ejaz being him and always thinking about other people, he couldn't sleep. He was worried that something was gonna happen. She couldn't, you know, take care of herself out there, being in a rough neighborhood, a single woman. So he calls her, tells her, you know, move your stuff out of there, come live in my house. It's a way better home neighborhood and I'll go live on somebody's couch. Again, she takes him up on this beyond generous offer and he just went above and beyond for her. He even offered to pay for community college so that she could get a better paying job. Just he's truly a heart of gold. The living situation came to a point where Ejaz was like, okay, I'm gonna, gonna kind of need my house back. If you're still, you know, in a situation where you're needing to stay here, we gotta figure something out. There really wasn't much to figure out. It was pretty clear that the only way that they could make this work was if Ejaz was married. He couldn't live with a female unless he was. So he suggests, you know, if you wanna stay, we can get married and see if we can fall in love. He said he expected nothing in return. If they fell in love, great. If they didn't, they didn't. But you know, stranger things have happened. Leo agreed. She didn't wanna give up her living situation. And on October 5th, 2002, they got married at Ejaz's mosque. Eventually a relationship did form. Leah said she was open to dressing more like a Muslim woman. She also wanted to learn more about the traditions so she would go with Ejaz to the mosque. And this was really what Ejaz wanted. He wanted somebody to share all of that with. And on top of that, she also got along really well with Jordan who would come and spend weekends with them. Ejaz and Jordan also had met her children on several occasions. Larry said Ejaz was a really good man. He could tell he had a big heart and he had to have a chuckle because the first time that him and Ejaz met, Ejaz went up to him and introduced himself and said, apparently you're, you're supposed to be pretty scary. And Larry pretty much just looked at him and said, oh, you probably haven't seen scary yet. Referring to the side of Leah that he knew. She did show those sides that he hadn't seen up until this point pretty quickly though. One time she showed up at a restaurant that Ejaz was with with a female coworker and caused a huge scene. She was accusing him of cheating and he said, this is my coworker. We are in no way romantically involved. That's against my religion. I mean, he wouldn't even have a female roommate, you know? He also found out that she had withdrawn several thousands of dollars from his bank account on multiple occasions without asking him. A friend of Ejaz also saw Leah be violent with him when she was accusing him of again cheating during an argument in their backyard one evening and she just started hitting him and all Ejaz was doing was just standing with his arms up protecting his face from her. It sounds like she was projecting her insecurities onto Ejaz because she heard herself was doing things behind his back. She would say that she was going to school or to work and really she would go and meet up with friends. She'd go out and use or go drinking and not come home for a night or two. Whenever he'd ask where she was, she would just say, I was working or it's none of your business. 
Things ended up coming to light in a huge way when one day she was ordered to take a drug test as a part of her parole. She takes the test, fails it, and because of that, she's ordered to go to court. When she tells Ejaz what happened, he's devastated. He didn't even know anything about her past. He just thought that she was a single mom that was going through a rough time after a divorce and just needed help to get her to degree, get a good job, and be able to have her kids back. When he found out he was really hurt, he felt manipulated, he felt lied to, he felt like he didn't even know who she was, which is fair. So after she went to court, she was ordered to serve six months in jail and she was ordered to start that sentence on May 1st, 2003. So there was a few weeks in between that date. Ejaz was a mess about the whole thing. He still wanted to help her. It's not in his nature to just turn his back on somebody, but he was trying to figure out how to go about that and also navigate his feelings. He definitely turned a lot to his friends and expressed his upset with them. He spoke a lot to his ex-wife's mother, his mother-in-law, who he still considered his mother-in-law, who he's very close with. Everyone's suggestion was that they knew he was a good man and he did all he could, but he just needed to cut his losses and divorce her. And while he agreed, he just didn't want to be the guy who got divorced again. His loved ones pleaded with him to just leave. They said each time they saw him, he just looked worse and worse than the last time. His ex-wife said every time he came up to pick up their son, his eyes looked like they were just dimming. And this is a real thing. I personally have seen this happen to somebody, even though they are no longer in that relationship that they were in, they've never been the same. And that seems really dramatic, but it's true. By the end of March though, he told his friends he had finally made the decision that he was gonna end things. His plan was to take her to a nice motel, have her stay there until she figured her stuff out. So he's still wanting to take care of her, but have his own space and his home back. It sounds like he does this, but a few days later, he calls his ex-mother-in-law and he's just distraught. And he says that she's broken back into the house and she's staying back there. And she tells him, no, go to the courthouse file a restraining order this is wrong so he said okay I'm gonna do that and I can't I don't think I can be helping her anymore because she's evil this was the last thing that he said about her to his ex-mother-in-law and this was the last time that she spoke to him on May 1st 2003 when Leah went to go turn herself in for her sentence it had been over three weeks since Bonnie his son Jordan and his mother-in-law had spoken to him they said Leah had called a few times to speak with them and Jordan and to let him know that his dad was out of town and she was just checking in because she was missing him. Ejaz didn't have a cell so she told him whenever she would speak to him at a hotel wherever he was that she'd ask him to call Jordan but she was just you know checking in for for her own kindness. She does this for a couple weeks and each time he was in a new location and still not calling to check in with them, but she's saying, oh, he's in West Memphis. Oh, he's back now, but he's he's just at the mosque. Then she started telling them that Ejaz went to Pakistan. And when she said that, they knew something was wrong. There's no way that he would just pack up and leave and go visit Pakistan and his family back there without telling his ex-wife or even asking if he could take Jordan with him. He had already taken Jordan when Jordan was six and it was a wonderful experience and it was something that he wanted to do again with his son. So why would he just up and leave without telling them and without asking Jordan? His ex-wife and friends didn't really know what to do. They tried to stop by the house to see him. He was never there. They even went and waited for him on days that they knew he would be at the mosque and never saw him. So on May 1st, Jordan's grandmother, who also happened to be an ex-police officer, shows up at the house and says she's not leaving until she figures out what's going on with Ejaz. She's got Jordan with her and the two of them go to the door. He doesn't answer. And when they start peeping through the windows, they see that the house is bare. They're like, where the heck is all of his furniture? And while they're looking, a neighbor across the street yells over, oh, they, they moved. They go over to see what this neighbor knows. And she says that just the day prior, the wife was out with a moving truck, said that her husband went to Pakistan and she was selling the house because she couldn't afford it anymore. Before they're about to leave to go to the police station to report that he's missing and something's going on. A little girl who lives in the neighborhood said that there was a chicken in the backyard still. It sounds odd, but Ejaz was a lover of animals and it wasn't unusual for him to just bring farm animals and have them live in his backyard. Jordan looks at his grandma and he's like, oh, that's mine. We can't just leave her behind. So Graham says, okay, let's 
go get this chicken. As they make their way to the backyard, they see this chicken and it's not easy to catch. So it runs into the shed that's back there. When they get to the shed to follow it, they're just blasted with this unbearable smell. The shed is blocked by this piece of wood. So they move it. They see this foam type mattress that is on the floor and it's just surrounded by flies. Jordan's grandma lifts up this mattress and just jolts back because she realizes there's a body underneath. Oh, I can't imagine. Obviously she calls 911. And then when the police arrive, they realize that it's so much worse than just a body being there. It appears to be a male body, but they have no way of knowing if it's Ejaz because there's no head or nether regions. When they go into the house to see what's going on in there, they see it's virtually empty and it also smells terrible. They say particularly in the bathroom and the bedroom, things looked suspicious. In the bathroom itself, there was almost like this brownish stain that appeared like somebody tried to clean it up, but not very well. And then in the bedroom, there was just a mattress and this big area of the carpet that was cut out. Quickly, they hear from friends and family that he was having issues with his wife. When they look in to see who Leah Ward, his wife is, they realize she's very easy to find because she's in prison. They go to speak to her and they tell her what they found in the shed and right away she admits that it is Ejaz and she shot him, but she did it in self-defense. She told detectives that the morning of the murder, Ejaz was really upset with her and he was accusing her of stealing this bag that he had that contained a lot of important documents. She said she knew nothing about this bag and couldn't give it to him and so he kept threatening to kill her. Fearing for her life, she said she went to the spare bedroom and got a gun that she had for protection and hid it in the bedroom and then went to have a nap. During this nap, she said she wakes up to hearing him screaming and pounding on the door to let him in. She said he busted down the door, he started screaming about this bag and he just started attacking her. Leah said at one point she managed to get away and lock herself into the bathroom, but then he went outside the house and tried to break in through the bathroom window. So she went back to the bedroom, grabbed the gun, and when he ran in and just started choking her, she said she pulled the trigger. At first she thought it misfired, but she shot him in the stomach. And so she said that she thought she had to shoot him again since it misfired. And the second shot got him in his chest. She said his last words were, you killed me. And he started praying in Arabic as he passed. For days, she said that she was just in shock and grief and left him in the bedroom. After a couple days, she said she tried to drag him to the bathroom and wanted to put him in the bathtub, but he was too heavy. So she grabbed this washcloth and started to cleanse him. She said she wanted to give him a proper cleansing for his religion. So she bathed him and then she wrapped him up in sheets and left him in the bathroom. He was there for a couple of weeks until Leah said the bathroom started to strongly smell of decomposition. And she panicked when she opened the door and she sees worms everywhere on the floor. She said she tried to clean the bathroom up, but again, she couldn't move Ejaz. So she went looking around the house and found a sword of his, something that isn't part of a proper cleansing and goodbye for a person you love, like she claimed she did, is the removal of one's head, but she did that. She says she doesn't remember where, but after she placed it in a bag, drove about 30 minutes outside of town and disposed of it in a garbage bin. She also admitted to doing the same to his personal region. She said she was finally able to get him into the shed when she used a rope to kind of fasten it around the body to make like a handle that she could drag and dragged him to the shed. He was only in the shed for two or three nights before she went to jail. So that whole time she was in the house with him. Since he was her provider for everything, she said that after she killed him, for weeks she pawned his belongings off to make money. He had four cars, she sold them. She sold the majority of the furniture in the house and also a lot of his jewelry. And just based on the accounts of everybody in the neighborhood and what she was kind of lining up with, it sounds like she was also trying to sell this man's 
home and his rental properties to make money off of that as well. On November 1st, 2005, her trial started. Prosecutors believed that this was in no way a self-defense case and that when Leah found out that Ejaz was going to leave her, she didn't want to be left to fend for herself again. The evidence in the bedroom where she said he busted down the door and started throwing around and doing structural damage to the room it wasn't there. There was no damage done to the room actually. The defense was still rolling with the self-defense route though, but it only took the jury two hours to come back with a guilty verdict of first degree murder. Leah's sentence was life in prison and that is where she still is today. It just breaks my heart because this man just seems so loving, so generous. He's the one who was sending so much money back home to take care of his family. He was also the primary source of income for his sister who became disabled after a fall and needed a lot of medical help, which is such a reminder of just like the trickle effect of taking somebody's life. One part of this that makes me just ill is that his willingness to help whoever he could was so strong and trying to find those loopholes to make it happen because he still wanted to respect his faith and his beliefs. So he gets married trying to do the right thing. Meanwhile, Leah was never even divorced from her husband. So all of this wasn't even a legal marriage. This woman even took Ejaz's ex-wife Bonnie's identity. I guess Ejaz had her ID so that he could file taxes for her and Leah comes across it and starts taking out credit cards in her name, racks them up and doesn't pay them. She was in Ejaz's life for six months and this is the damage that she did. I felt so awful for Bonnie reading about that because it took her years and years to rebuild the credit back. That's a stress on its own. On top of the fact that you're already dealing with the trauma of losing the, the father of your son who you were very close with. And this is just like a daily reminder as you're dealing with this, that the person who did that to you also took this love away from you. I have seen Jordan speak about his father and about Leah in an interview, and he is such an amazing person. It was in an interview I watched, I believe it was an episode of Women Behind Bars where he was telling the story and he said that he has forgiven her and that he believes that she does have remorse for what she's done. And I'm not gonna lie, I also did feel that you could see tinges of remorse in her interview. It appears that she's trying to better her life behind bars. She's gotten her GED. She attends computer programs. She's taken a cosmetology course. She also attends addiction meetings. My problem is though, is that she still paints each as, as the aggressor. And I just have a hard time believing that, not only just because of what everybody says their experience with him was and how wonderful he was, but just because the evidence in the house also shows that there was no huge attack that she needed to defend herself from. I do believe that people do things in their life that they deeply regret, especially in the depth of addiction. But if you are truly remorseful and you're sorry and your sentence is already decided, that's already done, I'm sure it would mean so much more to his loved ones, especially his son and his memory to just be 100% truthful. At the end of the day, I guess nobody except her knows if she is being truthful and that's the struggle. I think one thing we all can agree on though is that Ejaz would be insanely proud of his son. Alrighty, that is it for me today. Thank you all so much for watching. If you haven't already, please don't forget to like and subscribe. You know it means the world to me. I love and I appreciate you so much. The answer to today's riddle, quick reminder, Sam is talking to his lawyer in jail. They are very upset because the judge has refused to grant bail. At the end of the conversation, Sam is allowed to leave the jail. Why? And the answer is Sam was visiting his lawyer in jail who had been detained. Got him. Was that a silly one? That was a silly one, wasn't it? Oh, okay. All right, I'll see you in the next video. I will miss you terribly until then. Make sure to love each other, love yourself, and I will see you soon. Bye.